Thank you all for joining us. Uh, our session unpacking the stories behind health supply chain data. Uh, my name is Anna DePaiva, and I am the Director of Operational Excellence for Connexi. If you're not familiar with us, Connexi is a subsidiary of Commonix International that provides supply chain services and solutions to a broad spectrum of clients. We currently work with governments, international organizations, and the private sector. But like Commonix, we are also committed to the mission of working in low resource settings and helping catalyze meaningful change. Of course, in our case, that's through providing reliable access to everything from health products to education materials and other critical commodities. So really building on the impact Commonix has had, but with a laser focus on supply chain optimization and supply chain management. That's why I'm very excited to moderate this conversation today, because I know we could not do the work we do at Connexi without supply chain data. We certainly couldn't do it without putting analytics in the driver's seat. And I am just thrilled to welcome four guest speakers here who are also using supply chain data to drive meaningful improvements, but in four completely different settings. Um, some of these colleagues are also exploring advanced analytics to discover deeper insights or make predictions or generate recommendations. Uh, so it's a conversation that seems perfectly timed given the broader discourse about advanced analytics happening all around us today. I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves in a minute, uh, but before I do that, I'd like to just cover a quick housekeeping item. We will still have a bit of time for Q&A near the end of the session. For now, you're welcome to add questions in the chat during the conversation, and we'll, we'll be looking at the questions and select a few of them uh, for the panelists to answer. Some of the panelists may also choose to answer questions directly in the chat, so please do feel free to uh, comment as we go. And with that, without further ado, I would love for each of the panelists to introduce themselves and maybe as part of your introdu introduction, I'd love it if you could comment on your perspective around the role of data in health supply chains. Um, Kevin, could we start with you? Yes, good day to you all. Uh, very excited to talk with you today about uh, health, health supply chains and how we use data to um, improve them. I'm the country director for uh, the GHSC PSM project in Myanmar. Um, I've been the country director there for the last two and a half years. Um, just to give you a little background on uh, myself. So prior to that, I was working as an analytical scientist um, I, for 10 years. I spent four years at J&J &J working in the R&D and quality assurance labs. Um, and about five years at the United States Pharmacopoeial Convention, developing uh, mo modernized analytical techniques for quality assurance. Um, and it was there that I was actually exposed to global health supply chains. And I worked a bit on developing screening technologies for substandard and falsified medicines. Um, so that kind of brings me up to where, where I am now as country director and, you know, our project, we manage several different uh, supply chain strengthening areas, uh, management information systems is one of our key accomplishments um, over the course of the project. We manage a ELMIS um, called M supply that covers central state and regional levels in Myanmar. Um, we also have integrated that with the Power BI dashboard to help management decisions. And now we're trying to take that to the next level where we integrate uh, predictive analytics to see if we can um, you know, have a leading indicator of stock performance. And uh, I'm really excited to share with you, you know, some of our um, implementation strategies and how we're working to um, really make this a successful endeavor. And uh, we, we think this will be very um, critical for improving um, the supply chain in Myanmar, where you know we have many challenges with you know keeping stock levels uh, in, the, uh, in the optimal range across the country. So, thank you very much, and hand it off to the next uh, panelist. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin. We're excited to hear about that. Andrew, can we move on to you? Thank you. So um, my name is um, Andrew Ingalls. I am the Advanced Analytics Manager on the Health Systems Strengthening Project um, on the Global Health su uh, Supply Chain Procurement and Supply Management Project for USAID. Um, 
my role really has been for a number of years. Oh, I should actually mention that. Oh, so I am a, I work for IBM. We are a, um, a partner to Commonix on this project. Um, my role has been, and for a number of years, has been helping people use their data to make decisions. And so how's that played out within the supply chain? Supply chains are a transactional system. They're about moving product A from position A to position B. And it's about also about the exchange of finances to support the movement of that. All of this generates data. And really that data enables the supply chain ecosystem. And it really is an ecosystem to grow and um, continue to operate. Without that exchange of data, so without data itself, like within each organization, but without exchange of that data between organizations, you are not able to coordinate and the fundamental, opera fundamental operations of a supply chain would not operate. So the speed at which the supply chain can work, so how quickly it can deliver products, the complexity in terms of all the different types of products and the sheer volume of commodity mm. all, per, all operate directly linked to how well organizations can manage and use their own supply chain data and share it with partners enabling them to use it. So really what is the role of uh, data in health supply chains? It's like any other data, um, any other supply chain. It's the connector. It brings everything together. It connects the supply chains between all the actors, but it also connects it to the past, to where it was, where it is today, and where it'll be going into the future. Just as Kevin says, like doing that predictive piece, that's all based on data. Mm -hmm. So really, that's my where I see the role of data is as that real connector across the whole supply chain ecosystem. I love Thank that you. definition. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Tama, can we move on to you? You're on mute, mate. I'm here. I'm the senior technical advisor for the task order four. Um, we cover the area of maternal, newborn, and child health, working closely with approximately 14 country offices, a number of ministries of health. Um, and also international organizations such as the WHO, UNICEF. Um, um, our focus really here is the intersection of data, health, uh, and supply chain. Um, we, we work very closely with that, with a number of our country, really starting with the onset of looking at um, what is it that we can do to help um, address some of the challenges that are seen throughout the supply chain. And in order to do that, I, I usually always like to take a step back just to understand the critical nature of what data means. Why does it matter so much to have data and to have clear data, right? And uh, maybe some of you will be familiar with the parable of the blind and the, the blind man and the elephant, right? I, I see uh, some similarities there with data, right? We have three scenarios, basically. One, a room that is fully dark. And uh, we are expected to really understand what's going on in that room in order to upgrade it, to clean it up. We have another room that is half lit and we still have the same requirement. And we have a third room that is fully lit, right? We can actually see everything going on in that room. So the very first room that is completely in the dark is the room with zero data. Or, zero, or data that nobody trusts, zero confidence in that data that we have. Uh, the half lit room is some data. We don't have all of the data, but we have some. And the fully lit room is really the, the ideal state where we have all the data that we need. And based on that data, we can start making decisions that would impact the supply chain. And that's the, the critical nature of that. Right. So unless you have a state of a fully lit room, a state of fully accessible data that all the actors throughout the supply chain trust, it's very difficult to make decisions uh, that you yourself will have confidence in. And that is really where we come in, is to on, uh, underscore the critical nature of having or achieving the state of a fully lit room. 
And why does it matter so much? It matters so much because in, in a health area like the one that the task order for covers, we are talking about mothers, uh, pregnant women potentially giving birth. We're talking about uh, children, you know, with, with severe pneumonia. Uh, we're talking about small and sick newborns. So critical area where the healthcare provider really needs the medicine to be able to save life. And oftentimes the difference maker between having that medicine on stock and not having it is the quality of the data with which the entire supply chain works. Meaning if that data is good, then you have good fo uh, forecasting, you have good procurement and you have good stock management. And if we have a half lit room or a dark room, oftentimes you end up in situation where a mother is given birth and maybe oxytocin isn't available to save her life. Mm. Over to you. Yeah, interesting. That actually reminds me of a similar parable I've heard recently, which is in the land of the blind, one eye is king. So better to have some data than no data, but the journey really is towards getting to the fully lit room. Um, great, thank you, Tama. Kaluba, last but not least, can I turn it over to you? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Kalwa Mataka. I am the Regional Director um, for Delivery with Genesis Technologies based in Lusaka, Zambia. I've been working with ministries of health for the past 11 plus years, really looking at the use of information technology within the health setting. Um, the last three years, we've been working as an organization, as Genesis, working with the Ministry of Health in terms of integrating service delivery data together with supply chain data to be able to show the full picture and understand data. Um, as an organization, we operate in 10 plus countries across Southern, South America, Africa, and Asia. And our role is really to encourage data use within the ministries. Um, when it comes to supply chain, I think it's not only looking at the supply chain data, but being able to marry it to service delivery data so that users at the end of the day within the ministries can be able to see how is the data impacting the programs, how is it impacting patient level service delivery to the availability of commodities um, within the facilities. So it has been an interesting drive. Um, I'm new to supply chain. I've been working with the ministry for the past three years and just looking at the vastness of the systems and being able to integrate that and being able to visualize the data, um, triangulate the data, be able to provide analytics for ministries of health to be able to use that in decision making has really been um, revolutionary um, for the work that we do here in Zambia. And so this is really, um, as was mentioned earlier, a critical and a, a great topic to have and to discuss at this point in time. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. I can't hear, wait to hear your thoughts around capacity development in a bit. Um, but first, I, I'd love to start asking a question around challenges. Um, we know we've all encountered challenges in the use of data, and I would love to hear what some of the key challenges around data use have been for specifically in the health supply chain context for some of you. Um, what are key opportunity areas to better use data for operational decision making given those challenges? Um, Tama, I think given your scope of work, this might be a great point for you to begin with. Definitely a pertinent question, especially for us um, uh, in the area that we work with. Because um, you're right, uh, maternal child and new health um, doesn't always have the level of funding necessary you know, to like provide a full package or full range uh, of services. And that's a reason uh, you have to really be efficient with the low funds that are usually available in our space or the type of technical system that you provide. So that means the very first challenge often is getting the buy-in from all the actors uh, regarding the critical importance of the data, you know, and improving that data. Uh, oftentimes we just assume that it's there, but Actually, I, I do think it's always the very first step, ensuring that everyone is really brought on board in understanding why it's so critical to uh, do our very best to ensure that we have access to the best uh, quality of data. And, and it's, um, I, I do believe it's, it's a collaborative effort. It's not something that one 
person or, or you know, or HQ visits country office has to focus on. Um, another challenge that oftentimes obviously impact also directly the health of, of patient, it's uh, better forecasting, better procurement, better supply planning. All that is only done, you know, um, through improved data system, um, leading to better visibility throughout the supply chain, preventing uh, stock imbalances. Um, I would say those are key challenges that we've seen around uh, data use uh, and also opportunities to improving them um, through understanding what's the context we're working in. Because uh, oftentimes um, it's very important, at least the approach we're taking is making sure we let, we, leave, we let our colleagues in country define what's the priority for them instead of proposing solution. So we have developed a whole range of solution that we have categorized and put together in what we call the task order for data catalog. And now go to our country and say, what is it that you want to improve or what you want to better see throughout your supply chain? And based on their feedback, based on their needs, we sit together, look also what the context gives us, and then start developing the data solutions. Uh, we, you wouldn't want necessarily to come in an area, for example, or context where uh, there's limited availability of internet and start building a system that heavily relies, for example, of access on internet, right? Maybe for that specific context, you need a simple uh, data tool that is Excel-based, but still does the work very well, can still be shareable via emails. So I would say those are some of the challenges, but also opportunities that we have seen as we have been working very closely with our country offices and our colleagues at Ministry of Health you know, to help them improve the quality of the data at their disposal. Yeah, remembering that data works for the user and not the other way around. Excellent. Um, Kevin, can you share a little bit of your perspective? Yeah, no, I think that what, what you said, Tama, feeds directly into, you know, what I wanted to talk about, which was, you know, how to really implement a data analytics tool um, given you have this high quality data. So obviously, like you mentioned, step one is to make sure you have the high quality data. And with our ELMIS system in Myanmar, that's something that we have a really good handle on, um, specifically for the HIV AIDS program. We um, have very good on-time reporting, um, great data, visibil data visibility across many facilities. Um, so really, I would, what I want to focus on are the, the challenges coming after this, which is um, first, when you want to analyze that data, you need to identify the needs. So, um, you know, in Myanmar, there we have challenges, you know, maintaining adequate stock performance in many facilities. So there's definitely the need for some predictive type tool there. And I think that's um, quite obvious from um, some of the situations we found ourselves in. Um, and then identifying the tool. So what's the best tool that can solve this problem? Um, in our case, um, we know that the at Comonix, the, our health system strengthening team um, led by Andrew was working on this uh, inventory turnover tool. So this tool really interested us um, immensely. We looked at a few others, but this one seemed to be um, quite um, um, promising for how it could look at um, look at um, stock levels, perhaps two months into the future. Um, another step involved in this was choosing a platform. So you touched on this, Tama, where an Excel spreadsheet seemed to work best in your case. Um, in Myanmar, as I had mentioned previously, they've integrated Power BI into their ELMIS. So this is a much better platform for us to, to use our tool with. And so one of the next steps we took was to see if we could migrate the uh, visualizations from the inventory turnover tool that HSS team had developed into the Power BI platform. And we were able to do that um, fairly easily, actually. So um, that was a big achievement for our project to be able to get that into a very accessible platform for the beneficiary, in this case, the, the ministry. Um, 
And then the next step is really where we're at. So, you know, I've really identified about maybe 10 steps to get this into complete implementation to where, you know, this is, you know, self-sufficient and um, uh, re self-reinforcing. But the next step would be validating this tool. So this is where you want to look at all the different steps and potential challenges that may come once you start actually running that tool. Um, and that's the step we're actually looking at now. I think sometimes there is a, um, a tendency to race to the next step, which is you have a tool working, you just go straight into implementation um, once you have results. Um, but we think one of the, the, the best ways to go forward is to have a validation set, which really looks at a case study. So for example, looking at historical data to see how effective this tool is compared to um, perhaps a, a less sophisticated method that's been in use, such as looking at just months of stock um, in the current month and using that as a predictor. So, um, you know, with a full validation, you can really get a good handle on how effective that tool is, and that will make the advocacy much easier. Um, you know, and once you have a, a, a good validated tool which shows the performance, you need to design a pilot. Um, it's always easier to do this at small scale. That'll be the next step. Advocate um, with ministry. Um, and then you go into the training and, and um, executing that pilot. So for training, um, we have many different um, platforms we use for that. We've, we've done a lot of virtual training, but we find in-person training much more effective. And um, but one, one thing we have found that is a nice supplement to training that we discovered during our virtual training is creating on-demand videos for um, that can be accessible by trainees when you know the training's over. So we have website with YouTube videos showing things as simple as how to sign in to these tools and then how to um, um, execute more sophisticated um, um, applications within the tool. Um, and then, you know, you go to organization rollout, on-the-job training, supervisory visits, and then last step would just be maintaining that that tool and improving it over time. So, so yeah. Great. You know, I, I like the aspect of sustainability that you spoke about there. Once the initial excitement around using advanced analytics or rolling out a tool uh, are done with, the important thing is the commitment to continuously using and improving the tool. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I think it's actually a really good segue into the next question, which is around capacity development. I'm, I'm really curious around uh, what capacity development uh, that some of you might think is needed alongside these tools for commodity management and for sustainability to build on Kevin's answer. Um, what are some of the best practices you've seen for training stakeholders? Uh, Kevin just spoke about on-demand videos um, along with the trainings, but you know, I'd love to hear some of your uh, other perspectives as well. Kaluba, I know you've been doing a lot of work in Zambia with the Ministry of Health, so I'd love to start with you for this one. Thank you so much. Um, so when it comes to capacity building, I think the first thing is establishing trust with the users. Um, as you can understand with our ministries of health, there's so many partners that come on board. There's so many great and fantastic systems that are given to ministries of health to track their data. And of course, with supply chain, not being spared the amount of, of systems that are being developed. Um, so firstly is, um, in order to build that trust is understanding the pain points of your users. What is it that they use the data most? What are the reports that are created? And really sitting down with them and understanding which of the systems do they use for reporting? How long does it take them? What are their pain points with the systems that they have? And one thing that we've also found, especially around building capacity, creating that trust and creating that drive for more user trainings and for more users to be onboarded is identifying champions within the different units and programs that you're working with in the Ministry of Health. So for example, with our work with malaria, we identified two champions who are really critical in driving the conversation and the use of data. 
Um, one was a biostatistician and another was a program manager under case management. And what we did was we firstly um, sat with them to understand what their pain points were, what uh, reports are, are needed, how they use their data, and then take a step back and look at all the systems that they're using and see if they truly understand the data that is being collected um, by their respective programs, right from supply chain data, what systems are being used, do they understand the indicators, to service delivery, what systems are being used, do they understand the data elements and the indicators, and what we found was more often than not, users will tell you they have access to a system, but not really understand the indicators that are being collected, and so we took a step back to firstly begin explaining the indicators, how they are related, how they all align with each other. And then another great avenue that really helped was COVID um, because in the times of COVID we couldn't physically meet, we couldn't physically train. And so we had to be inventive in terms of what other mechanisms could we use for training. So online trainings also came in handy. And what we discovered was that it's not more often than not, you don't need the centralized trainings where you call everyone into one space because sometimes a lot of things get lost in translation. But really having those online sessions, creating one-on-one -on -one sessions where you really go to where the user is found, take the time to sit down with them, uh, work through their data needs, the visuals, the data analytics. What we found was being able to place yourself in the seat of your users creates not only the trust, but it also builds confidence in the data. And aside from that, you're also giving them a skill that they could utilize and use for their work. So it's really being there for the users, helping them to understand their systems. And one thing that we do really well as an organization is that we don't temper with the source systems, but we work with the users for them to understand their data. And sometimes you even come across situations where they have to reevaluate the indicators that they're collecting because now that they're looking at the bigger picture, they've discovered that their data is not making sense. For example, your service delivery data is not speaking to your to the commodities that you've dispensed or the commodities that you're ordering. And this really comes in handy, especially when you're looking at things such as stockouts, facilities that are overstocked, or even when it comes to forecasting and quantification, because then you can take a step back and see how did we perform in the previous months, in the previous years versus where do we project ourselves going? And so really building that confidence in the data and building that trust is the first step. And we found that very useful um, with working with the ministry. Thank you. Thanks. And it links back to the earlier message about quality being more important than quantity. There can be a lot of data available, but maybe it's not the right data and it's not serving the, the user's needs. Andrew, uh, can I ask you to add your perspective on that one? Thank you. First off, Kaluba hit the, it right on the nail ahead by the word trust. Mm. And trust is absolutely critical in multiple parts to this. Um, one part is, hang on, computer just did something silly. All right, so we, we, trust is an important part of this, not, not just within the partnership, but within the information they're using to make a decision. And one of the things that we have noticed um, as we have evolved over things is change, excuse me, changing the mindset is a really critical part into how data is viewed within the system. I'm gonna say previously, data used to be kind of viewed as a way of reporting. This is what happened in the past. This mm -hmm. is what, what we did. This is where everything uh, has happened beforehand. And what needing to change is that that data needs to be helping me figure out where I'm going into the future. Where am I going forward? And so there is a change in that mindset in terms of how the data is viewed. And mm -hmm. then also that trust in partnership because not everybody wants to be a data scientist. I want to be a data scientist. I love it. This is the thing I love to do. But I know that that's not what everyone's about. And what we need to be understand is when we get a form of partnership with users, they have a role that they want to play and the role that they are frustrated at the moment that they're not able to achieve easily. 
And our role as data scientists or people who love data analytics is to enable them to make decisions at the time they need to make decisions. And that's what data an analysis is about. It's about being able to look at a, some analytics and be able to make a decision. And that kind of like has, requires a couple of things to happen. And one of the things is, as Kaluba was talking about, changing the, met, the KPIs or the, the indicators they're measuring to, around so it enables them to make that decision. That's what you, when you're looking at it that way, that's what you're doing. One of the other things which I know that a lot of people say is, ah, the data isn't good enough yet. I can't make, rely on the data to, to make decisions. Really what comes about in, within that kind of context is we need to be designing our analysis for failure. So what do I mean by that? We've got to be designing it knowing that there is going to be issues with the data. We've got to design it in a way that still enables someone to make a decision, even if the data is not perfect. And that is a thing that we should be uh, looking at doing as we're going forward. So how do we do this? And that is something which I think COVID has actually really helped us along with in many ways, because it's highlighted something. It's highlighted the importance of that in-country engagement with users to understand what's going on. But it's also highlighted that we don't need to have the data scientists necessarily go out there mm -hmm. and be there to do it. What we can do is we can find a balance between the team in country who's engaged every day with the users and understands what's going on and a team of data scientists in another, another place to help take advantage of what I call the portability of data. So data can be now these days moved a lot more effectively. This allows us for ease of communication, sharing of tools and an ability to co-create and are able to do things. And this really lends itself, which I think is an important aspect to building that trust, is that like an agile approach to development and implementation. Because a data scientist comes up, I've got a great new piece of an analytics, let's put this tool in. And the data user kind of goes, uh, I don't get it, or it's not really answering my question. You've got to have that ability mm -hmm. to evolve and do that iteratively because there, is a, there are nuggets of truth on both sides and we need to bring those two together to make things work. And it also is a transition of role. So at the beginning, when you're first getting into sorting out the analytics, the data scientist might be taking a bit more of a greater role than what, what would have been at the beginning as he's figuring out all, all the data piece. But as time passes on, that's got to transition. He's got to, as they say, work himself out of a job and because it's not his role. The role is the people on the ground to be doing it. And as I said early on, it is about designing for failure so that it still enables the people to make decisions. And I think another key aspect is recognition of the, this is a collaboration. This is not one thing you go, all right, I get the data, I hand it over to them, they send me something back. That is never going to work. It's got to be this collaboration and communication. That's how you build that capacity. And there's two final points I'd make. First off, change happens. Change is going to continuously happen. So you can't design your system for how it was in the past. It's going to be changing as you go forward. And sustainability to me is driven by design. It's to ensuring that the design is for both solution today and for going forward into tomorrow. But you have to have an idea of when the endpoint is. You have to understand when this tool will be superseded. When, when will its needs be changed? I think a lot of people think of analytics as this kind of capital investment. Like I invest in, in this, build the tool once, it then is going to sustain on for, for, for quite a while. You really kind of got to do, figure out when do you think you're going to be needing for a new tool because things change. Other things are going to change in your environment 
which then will change the benefit of the tools that you have developed today. So I think it is designing for replacement is also a key aspect of it in terms of that long-term sustainability. We can't just think that we build the tool once, we push it on out, and then that's going to be it because things change. And unless we're there to, to understand that, we're going to run into trouble. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. I like the perspective of continuous improvement, recalibration of tools over time. And I especially like what you said about building the trust in the data yeah. because there has been that transition in the past. You know, we, we got the data, a lot of work was done after the data was available. Yeah. Now, the data is available. If we do the work up front, uh, we can help ease decision making once, you know, almost live, almost in, in real time. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, again, I think this is another excellent segue into the next question. This is the last question. I do want to mention that the session has been extended by 15 minutes. So we will have some time still at the end for Q&A with the participants here. Um, but with that, I'll ask my last question. Um, I would love to hear from each of you uh, an example of how data is being used for advanced analytics. So any kind of prescriptive or predictive analytics. We've heard a couple of high level examples, but if you could provide a little bit more detail for our participants today, that would be great. Um, and I think Kevin, you are uh, the perfect person to lead off this question. Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Um... I just wanted to mention or pause on this prescriptive analytics term. I, it's the first time I actually heard that was in this panel. And uh, I actually really like this term. Um, I generally use the term predictive analytics, but when I thought about it, um, prescriptive analytics is actually the next level because not only are you predicting what you expect the outcome to be, but you are prescribing some sort of decision um, or an action to be um, performed based on that prediction. And that's really what we're trying to do with the uh, inventory turnover tool. So um, it takes your data, you know, quality data, um, even if it's not so high quality, it still takes that data. And then it translates that into information, which of course is an important step, but simultaneously the script for this tool will turn it into a presentation as well as, um, kind of a decision matrix tree for manage, you know, supply managers to directly say, okay, this is the action we need to take. Um, but they get to see, you know, all the steps simultaneously with this tool, just using the script. So um, I just really like this prescriptive uh, analytics term terminology. I think I'll be using it more often. <laughs> but um, so the, the inventory turnover tool, for those of you who don't know, this is, um, it's an analysis where you take the average months of stock and you divide that by the average consumption over that same period. Um, so generally you're looking at quite a large window. Um, so that's really the power behind the tools. It's looking at a very large data set and then that gives it the ability to predict um, further out into the future. So we consider this a leading indicator. Um, in addition to just calculating this inventory turnover, which is you know the frequency at which your stock is may need to be replenished. Um, so you're comparing that with you know, your replenishment rates, so if it's quarterly, you're expecting about four times a year that you would get turnover um, four times per year. So um, we're also looking at the consumption variability. So how does that um, impact the result that we get? So, um, you know, if you're having lots of variability in consumption, um, you may say, well, the data is not high enough quality because it's we have all this unpredictable consumptions just going all over the place. Mm -hmm. However, we you know this what I like about this tool is that it actually takes that into account. And rather than kind of throwing that data out, it'll say, well, you should take a closer look at this facility, maybe visit it, see what's going on. Um, so even in the case where you have maybe some ambiguous data, um, there's still action that can be recommended. So um, even bad data can be um, uh, actionable. So, so it, it really is a, you know, a very interesting tool. Um, you know, and, and so as I mentioned, this tool just takes you direct, directly to the decision-making process. And um, 
yeah, I, I think that that's uh, I'll I'll leave it to the next panelist to to build upon that. But really like this uh, this terminology. <laughs> Excellent, and the perfect panelist to build on that I think is Andrew, who's worked on the tool as well, right? Yeah. So yeah, this is that that prescriptive piece is absolutely correct. So um, I'm going to be quick here on this, but because Kevin's pretty much covered it all. But really what we're doing is we're setting this up. So as soon as the data comes in, the analysis is done. And that's when what Cam's mentioning by the script is like, we've done all the thinking and all mm. the decision-making kind of de defining before the data has arrived. We've looked at the historical data, we've figured out what's going on. And then we're coming up with it. This is why we're doing this validation process, so we can actually show it in really clearly way, clearly to others. But the idea is, as soon as the data comes, the analysis can come. So you're not sending this off to someone else to wait for getting some some analysis back to do something. As a decision maker, mm -hmm. you then have it there in front of you that you're able to then act. The second thing, which is also critical is being able to see the consequences of either your action or inaction, because you're able to see that in the next piece in terms of what is happening. So it's about creating that positive feedback loop, not just within the data, but within the decision-making process itself. And that is what is kind of like key is mm -hmm. uh, with these things is designing for helping the system use the information it has to improve itself. So that that, that would be the only things which I would add to that. But it, it's, yeah, we're I'm looking forward. We've got a little bit more work we're doing with Kevin. I'm looking forward to it. And um, we hope to be able to be sharing some things out later. Excellent. Uh, Tama, maybe we can turn it over to you next. example i'll bring up is uh the consumption anomaly tools that we work very closely with the andrew and team to to develop and we are currently actually implementing and have implemented in some countries uh to the point where we are now having uh, cross learning you know being able to actually put colleagues in touch from one country to the other to share lesson learned best practices on maybe how some have been more um successful as the, at implementing it in, in country uh, but really what the tool does is uh, taking historical data matching it with current uh, data set and um, trying to identify some areas that showing up as anomalies right for example you see uh, in some health facility high turnover rate right what does that mean for that particular facility what does it maybe means to the regional medical store that is tied to that facility right um, you'll see also based on that tool potentially some facilities that are having very low turnover rate so in a system that has been uh, less agile and as kind of just prescribed kind of quantity that can be uh, sent across different region, a tool like this becomes very critical because it helps respond to challenges in almost in real time, where you can say, okay, for this number of facility, we are seeing that the commodities that we are sending over there are not moving as fast as they should, and therefore we should reduce potentially the number of uh, the quantity of medicine we're sending there, or it poses the larger question of, is there something else going on there? Are patients maybe not accessing the medicine and the services that they need? Um, one uh, interesting and benefiting aspect of this tool is that in some of our country, it has actually led the ministry to be able to identify area of leakages of medicine, you know, and conduct yeah, further, further investigation to really find out what are the challenges there. Uh, overall, the, 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 the tenet of all the work really leads to decision making, right? The better the data we are using, the better the tool we are developing, uh, the better the decision that we can make. And uh, that's where the aspect that Andrew mentioned, the refactoring comes in. Uh, and that's something we have continuously done, meaning 
we implement, we develop the tool, like the consumption anomaly tools, we implement it in country, we work with our colleagues to put together user guide video that are easily accessible for training of trainers. Um, and then as time goes on, as challenges, new challenges arises, as new focus potentially arises, we help improve the tool because um, I also see, especially in the field of maternal health, I also see data visibility and quality as a important advocacy tool. You can really advocate for more funding. You can advocate for uh, more procurement of these commodities that are usually essential commodities if you are not able to really tell what are the true need, you know, based on every facility you have around the country. So ultimately, I always say in order to improve health, we need to improve supply chain. In order to improve supply chain, we need to improve data quality. Thank you. Well said. Well said. Kaluba, can I turn it uh, over to you? Last but not least, again. Yes, no, thank you. Um, I think I have I have two two examples looking at it from um, both a routine data use to um, focusing on quantification activities. Um, so what we have done with our tool is enabled, for example, our malaria team on a monthly basis, we've built a dashboard where they look at the disease trend, not only from a facility level, but from a community perspective and being able to have a partners and you're able to view how the malaria program is, is performing across the country. And as you know, malaria comes with seasonality. So being able to look at those trends um, in the disease burden and then meet with partners and discuss how and when best to have certain interventions has really been helpful. And looking at the data, not only from a central level, but being able to drill down right through to facility level to see how your programs are performing, how your interventions are performing has been revolutionary um, for, for the ministry and, and being able to share that data as it comes in has also been fantastic. And then when you're looking at activities such as focusing on quantification, what used to happen in the past is that um, the ministry would set up a team to begin early preparations in terms of focusing on quantification. And often what would happen is it is at this point they would find inconsistencies in the data, data quality issues would come up, and then they would have to go back to each individual facility to find out what is happening, which would then make the whole process of focusing on quantification very time consuming. But working with the teams, what we've been able to do is you not only create dashboards for the users at the central level to view what is happening in terms of service delivery and commodity usage, but then you also give this ability to the provincial users, to the district users, so that at any point in time, your district personnel is able to go into the platform, look at what is happening with their facilities in terms of the disease burden versus the commodities, be able to have actions around um, if they are noticing that uh, a certain particular commodity is being consumed more than um, the patients that the facility is seeing, and that then having a bearing when you're looking at it at that central level, you are rest assured that the data that you're seeing is to a certain quality because both the provincial and the district levels have been able to take a look at that. Um, and it's more critical even at the district level because they are as close to the facilities as possible and giving them that access to their data, them being able to run analytics and see how they're performing or how their facilities are performing in that district has been fantastic. And it also eases the the time that you have um, to correct things like data inconsistencies, data quality issues. And that has been really fantastic. And it has helped shorten the time for focusing on quantification at the central level, because then you're looking at the data and being able to make uh, meaningful analysis. Um, it's also critical for data visibility as well, because then you have your Ministry of Health officials knowing that at any point in time, they can go into the system, run whatever analytics they want to run because they do have access to the data and they do have access to all the systems that are relevant um, for them to be able to make meaningful change. So data visibility is critical. 
Um, it also helps with data quality and completeness because it's just not a process that's happening at one point in time, but it's a process that is continuous because everybody is able to see the data. So that was that has been really revolutionary for us and has helped in terms of not only drive use of the system, use of the data, but also having users want to have the systems, want to have more additional systems integrated for them to be able to make more meaningful analytics. Thank you. There's that underlying trust as a as a common theme across this entire session today. Thank you very much, Kaluba. Uh, before we close the session, I do want to leave a little bit of time for Q and A. Uh, there has been uh, there have been a few questions coming in. I'm just going to and I know some of you have answered them in the chat already. Thank you for that. I'm just going to pick a few more, uh, uh, maybe one or two more um, uh, comprehensive questions for us to tackle, and then we can open it up to the other participants. Um, so I saw that there's and Tamla, thank you for answering it in the chat. I think it's a really pertinent question, so I'm going to uh, uh, read it here anyway, and we can address it as a as a as a panel. Um, Atsushi asked, many countries are concerned with personally identifiable data to go out of their jurisdiction, and some countries are moving toward data localization. Also, many countries are aligning their privacy laws to uh, GDPR and related laws, with, which make it challenging for cross-border data transfer, even if there could be potential benefits. I think that's key. Are there some good practices of cross-border health data transfer while safeguarding privacy of patients and mitigating concerns? Uh, Tama, do you want to speak a little bit to your answer and then we can open it up to the other panelists as well? Uh, very pertinent question, I agree. Uh, reminded me of my time when I was actually working as the, the PPMR and uh, the goal really at that point was early generation of data on the reproductive health uh, area. And the goal at that time was really trying to quantify the need for commodities uh, on the global scale, right? So we, the requirement was really being able to access country data. And we developed pretty strong uh, protocol and guidelines to ensure that country were comfortable sharing obviously some of that data and that third party would not be able to access that data without express approval of this country. But now we are moving, I believe, in terms of best practice is in um, a new area where the focus now, it's really working hand in hand with our country partners in developing tools and enabling an environment where users feel comfortable using those tools like Kaluba was mentioning. And at that point, really, the data feed, the analysis, lesson learned from all that uh, can remain in country and no longer necessarily pose the risk of leaving the, the jurisdiction. However, there are always instances where you really also need data on a global scale to be able to better predict what are the need and prescribe some of the decision, uh, not only for the country, but sometimes for the donor community. We talked about advocacy earlier. And in those instances, um, what I've seen uh, in terms of best practices, again, is building strong guidelines around that. You mentioned GDPR is one example. Of, um, there are more of them that are coming, but ultimately the direction is toward uh, data uh, interoperability of system across the globe, but also of data localization, making sure that we have in country the expertise needed to develop and refactors. That means improve on those tools and uh, provide and look for the decision in country that are needed, taken there by the, the colleagues in, based in, in those places as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tama. Uh, panelists, do any uh, of you want to add anything to Thomas' answer? The, the, one, the one thing which I would add is, especially on the data analytics size and the generation of tools for, for, a, for a country and such, that one of the things which Tamara mentioned in his presentation was about making the tools generic so so we build it in one country but then refactor it to be able to be used in another and really what we're trying to do in this instance is remove the data from the tool so the tool is built 
And that is really where the data scientists are really coming on in, is in the building of the tool mm -hmm. and then handing it across to the country to say, right, now I'm going to click in my data and it's, it's able to handle that data coming on in and do the output and, and analysis. So everything remains within the country for the utilization of that tool. One thing which is part of that, which is where this partnership comes up in, is creating this trust and partnership within that, with that country in how to use that tool. And that you have to do with their data and that has to be done in partnership with them. But really what we're doing is we're designing it at the end is where they can go, bye-bye. You don't, you can't see this anymore. This is ours. We'll only allow, we'll only come and knock on your door when we need you. And that means that it, it is all remaining with them. So you're designing this with the idea that they remain in control of their data. You have to design with that in pace because otherwise you cannot maintain trust. And that is the key thing that you have to do. You break that, it gets around. You all of a sudden, your organization, mm, they ain't, mm. not, other people are not going to give you any work. So you have to build it with maintaining that trust in mind. So, Thanks, yeah. Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, Eligio, I see you've asked a question. Uh, are you measuring the performance of district health service delivery using uh, indicators? And are these indicators aligned with the national health strategy from the Ministry of Health? I'm not sure if you intended that for a specific panelist, but it may uh, apply to you, Tama, perhaps also you, Kaluba. And then um, pass over to you, Kaluba. Yes. Um, so definitely um, one of the things that we're also looking at is um, performance around service delivery. And of course, yes, it has to align with the national health strategy for the Ministry of Health. And really, this is where the collaboration comes in, because we are, like Andrew mentioned, we're the builders of the system. We build the system, we impart the knowledge in our users, and then we're giving them the capacity for them to be able to say, bye-bye, thank you so much, you've built this application for us, and we're now able to use it. So it has to be built within the confines of the ministry. Um, we are also able to measure, of course, yes, service delivery based on the indicators and the data elements that the ministry has identified, the key performance indicators, um, and also ensuring that the users that need to have access, these are the m &E teams, the ICT teams, um, and of course the program managers are able to access that information and that data. So of the, that coordination and collaboration is there 100% because you are building a tool to be used by the ministry for the ministry. And so it has to align with all, uh, with the national strategy, as well as enable them to be able to measure how they're performing. Um, so definitely it's 100% user-led and we are working to work ourselves out of the job so that at the end of the day, the power is given to the users to the system. By the ministry for the ministry is a great slogan for this whole exercise. Thank you. Tama, do you want to comment on that one as well? But did a much better job than I did <laughs> question. Just really <laughs> emphasizing what she said, really. It's um, you know, um, obviously no work goes without following the strategy that the country or the Ministry of Health has indicated. Uh, it's the only way, like Andrew mentioned earlier, we build trust. But it's also the right way to approach any work, I would say, especially, you know, as we're building sustainable system. So um, that always is an indicator that's critical for us. But we go further than district, actually. The, our goal, and that's what we've been implementing recently, is to go all the way to health facility visibility. And we are realizing that when you build um, easy to uh, adjust system in country, you are actually able to get some of that data, right? It's not always 100% validated, it's not always strong, but we are actually in uh, building some tools that are adjustable based on the, the district or even the health facility in country where in some instances, you know, that data would be accessed or collected through Excel and in other 
in the central level, you'll be able to do the validation, you know, to a much better tool such as Power BI. So it's really all about adaptation to the context we're working with and ensuring that the user is comfortable with working with that, that uh, tool as well. Thank you so much, Tama. And I think we might have one more minute for a last question, if there is one. Great. If there's not, um, I'll just I'll do a quick wrap up here. Um, I think we've heard today about challenges in collecting data, applying data, sustaining the use of data. But what really came through for me certainly was that human aspect. Um, at the end of the day, the data is meant to serve a human need. And the best chance for success to use any kind of analytics, um, and especially advanced analytics in, 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 in this environment, is when we focus the data on addressing the most critical needs and when we demystify the data and the tools so that its meaning, their meaning, and their purpose are, are clear. So I want to thank the four participants for sharing your best practices and your lessons learned with us. Uh, a recording of this session will be available uh, it, you know, in about 15 minutes after this session on the GDDF platform. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on behalf of my colleagues. Anyone is welcome to connect with us uh, via LinkedIn or uh, on other platforms, and uh, we'll be happy to chat further. So thank you again, panelists. Thank you to the participants. We hope this session was helpful. Thank you all.